It's an abbreviation for postural tachycardia syndrome. Um, it's not really so much an illness as an abnormal physiologic state. It's almost like saying congestive heart failure. And it occurs when the body is unable to maintain its blood pressure adequately in mainly because there are three things that maintain blood pressure. Your heart rate, the force at which your heart contracts, and the tightness or looseness of the blood vessels in the body or what we call vascular tone or vascular resistance. In POTS, the vascular resistance part doesn't work. Vessels do not maintain their normal tightness and blood tends to pool in the lower half of the body. And then there is a compensatory increase in heart rate and myocardial contractility as a compensation. And while compensatory enough to keep the person from becoming, from their blood pressure getting very, very low, it's nonetheless not compensatory enough that they feel completely well. Ergo, they begin to experience symptoms of fatigue, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, um, inability to exercise, and ultimately at some times they can lose consciousness. The conservative estimate in the United States has been 500,000 people, uh, some estimates say up to a million people, and it's all age groups. Uh, it, for the most part, uh, it begins sometime in adult. We see a group of patients develop it in adolescence, but really throughout the spectrum. It tends to be a five to one female to male ratio. Um, the adult group tends to be at almost any age and oftentimes follows a viral infection of some sort where the vi viral infection seems to trigger a kind of autoimmune response that damages the vasculature. In the case of children, many of the children we see have a genetic condition referred to as type 3 Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and it's also known as Joint Hypermobility Syndrome, in which their vasculature is more elastic than normal and doesn't maintain norm normal degrees of tightness. Uh, there are a number of different things that can trigger POTS, however, and it's, as I said, it's really more an abnormal physiologic state and there are a number of ways to get to that abnormal physiologic state. When people are severely affected, it, they are become totally bedridden. It destroys their lives. Uh, in the patients we tend to see, and we tend to see the sickest people um, all from all over the United States and many other countries as well, uh, they are unable to maintain many of the normal regulatory functions that people take for granted. Ergo, every time they go to stand up, they become extremely lightheaded, dizzy, fall. Um, frequently, they are plagued by digestive problems. They get gastroparesis, severe constipation, um, because the autonomic system also regulates gastrointestinal function. They are unable to maintain normal body temperature. They, they will feel either freezing cold or, or very, very hot when everyone else feels somewhat normal. Um, the illness in a full-blown state can destroy the life of a person. The diagnosis is principally clinical, but there are certain features that, that are used as a standard diagnostic pattern. One is you should document a reproducible increase of at least 30 beats per minute from going from, sit, from lying to standing in the heart rate um, or a heart rate that exceeds 120 beats a minute. And this should occur in the absence of other conditions known to cause it. So the patient shouldn't be dehydrated at the time you're checking them. They shouldn't be taking other medications that could produce that pattern. In children, we use a cutoff of 40 beats a minute because the heart rate increases in children tend to be a little more, more um, noticeable. <coughs> they also, though, have, a, uh, by the constellation of symptoms they have, such as fatigue, cognitive impairment, dizziness, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, and, and the like. Other conditions can cause similar symptoms, and you have to be careful that you're diagnosing the right condition, that you're treating the right condition. And there are a number of other things that can mimic it. And, um, you know, we carefully try to tease that out. 
and at times we order different tests if we're not sure of our diagnosis. Tilt table testing is one of them. There are other kinds of autonomic nervous system testing that can be performed. But for the most part, diagnosis tends to be still a clinical one. One of the backup systems that human beings have that's unique to human beings is called the skeletal muscle pump. And what that refers to is contraction of the leg muscles and to a lesser extent the abdominal and arm muscles compresses the venous system and propels blood back to the heart. A healthy set of legs can raise your blood pressure up to 10 points. There's a vicious cycle that develops in many patients with POTS because they start to feel ill they stop exercising, they lose their muscle tone, that makes them feel worse, they do less, and it's a vicious cycle. And one of the principal modalities for getting people better is to recondition them. You have to do the very thing that makes them feel badly. The same as after knee surgery, when it hurts to bend your knee, the first thing they do in physical therapy is bend your knee. Um, so we very gently but very progressively try to recondition people working towards the goal of doing a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic activity three times weekly and at the same time interspersing it with resistance training. We have pre-printed um, programs that we give out to people that they can use as a guide and then modify it according to their needs. Some people do better with water activities. Some people do better with a recumbent bike. Some people do better with a rowing machine. But one of the principal things we do is try to recondition them and at the same time increase their salt and fluid intake. In individuals where those measures are insufficient to relieve their symptoms, there are a number of pharmacotherapies that can also be employed to help ameliorate some of the symptoms. Uh, among adolescents who have their onset very abruptly during adolescence. There's a group of them that can grow out of it. Um, and this they usually do by the time they're in their late teens or early 20s. With the post-viral patients, at the end of five years, if you look at what's happened, up, up to 70 percent have made a significant improvement. So many people can recover from it, from this and uh, do not face a lifetime of disability. But in some people, their, their lives are permanently changed. And you have to work with them and get them to the best quality of life they can achieve.